स्टैटिक्स और डायनेमिक्स के बारे में तो आप लोगों ने बहुत बार सुना होगा बट आज बात करेंगे नॉन लीनियर डायनेमिक्स के बारे में और नॉन लीनियर डायनेमिक्स के बारे में समझेंगे उसका एप्लीकेशन लाइफ के बारे में क्या एप्लीकेशन है नॉन लीनियर डायनेमिक्स का लाइफ में उसके बारे में जानेंगे और काफ़ी सारी बातें जानेंगे डॉक्टर एम लक्ष्मणन के बारे में जी हाँ आज हमारे साथ रोजेंडर टॉक्स पर मौजूद हैं डॉक्टर एम लक्ष्मणन भारती दासन यूनिवर्सिटी से और सर जो है वो नॉन लीनियर डायनेमिक्स आज हम लोगों को समझाने वाले हैं तो चलिए शुरू करते हैं कॉन्वर्सेशन के साथ और मिलते हैं डॉक्टर लक्ष्मणन से Very welcome to you, sir. How was your lockdown, sir? Yeah, it has been a, a very tough time. Uh, yes, we have gone through two lockdowns. Yes, sir. So, last year one and this year one. So this year it was almost three months or so, and uh, so we couldn't go to the university for uh, quite a few months. And uh, but uh, we could get. in contact uh, through online mode through through web with my group so we used to have regular meetings online so life was going like that but it is not a very pleasant thing you know we need a direct uh, face to face meetings so how, how was your experience in, with zoom and other meeting apps yeah uh, in mean, uh, most of our meetings were through google but we did use zoom also quite a bit uh, but they have been very useful in this uh, in this uh, difficult period so these apps were quite useful and we got used to it okay and uh, i have been giving lectures uh, when I mean, attending online conferences uh, all over the world so giving lectures and so on but it's a it's not a, a standard experience you know you talk and you don't know what is the other side how they receive it or whether they like it or they are following it and so on so forth. but uh, under the circumstances i think this is the best we can go for so so life goes like this uh, but i think uh, i do hope that uh, things will become normal uh, at the earliest so we have now open so for the past one month we are going to the university we are meeting people but still there are lots of restrictions so yeah that's how life goes so how is it in delhi so how is it in delhi it's not better it's now a bit better but uh, uh i have came to know that uh, past for past one months students have started going to schools but now the schools are again shutting down and because uh, it's been uh, like it's been observed that the cases are now increasing from uh, past months so yeah. now they are just shutting down schools again and uh just <laughs> so the experience of the school students i don't think that that is uh like uh, they are also getting bored in this in like home quarantine and all because there is nothing much to learn and nothing much to even meeting with friends and meeting with teachers gives a lot of uh like changes the mind of a person but now they are they are just stuck at their homes and now the there is complete mess i can say uh, in that context so that's yeah, a I different thing it's a tough time yeah, but i do hope that we will come over and come through it soon yeah. yes sir yeah. so uh, sir you have done an extensive research in non linear dynamics so what exactly can you tell us what exactly non linear dynamics is like who, what kind of physics are we talking about in this yeah i will try to explain in a, a simple manner as possible uh, so non linear dynamics so there are two aspects this non linear let us try to understand what is non linear and then what is dynamics and what is non linear dynamics 
so you know non linear linear so non linear is the opposite of linear so what is non linearity what is linearity so i think as students of science i think the audience are uh, essentially are students of science so you know a line a straight line ji okay. straight line you can represent say in terms of two variables say y equal to x given yeah. x what is y okay so there is an one to one correspondence so you can plot this relationship given input input x output is y so you can plot this by giving various values of x and ask what is y so if you plot in a two dimensional plot okay it will be a straight line passing through the origin at 45 degrees so for every x there is an y there is a direct relationship one to one relationship we can also slightly modify this y equal to some m into x where m is some constant say so depending on this constant value of this constant this line will shift a bit okay? orient slightly in different directions so y equal to mx but you can also add y y equal to mx plus c c a constant so instead of passing through the origin this line will get slightly shifted but still x is the input y is the output m the slope and c the intercept that they are constant given constant so in this form y equal to mx plus c the relationship between x and y are one to one so we it's a straight line graphically yes it's a linear line line it's linear but if you change this form y equal to some say ax square x x square means x into x a is a constant it becomes a parabola it's a curve yes sir, yes, sir. now it's not just a, a linear relationship it is a non linear relationship okay y equal to ax square input is x so you take the square x square the output is y okay. so the relationship between x and y is not linear not linear so it's non linear so this is the important uh, uh, understanding of linearity and non linearity because yes. function you define a function a function is given a variable an independent variable x is an independent variable because you can assign any value and you ask obtain y so that is a dependent variable because it depends on x so dependent variable independent variable okay so this is a, a, a linear relationship y equal to mx plus c y equal to ax square it's a non linear relationship simple relationship or to even put it in a, even more general terms for the general audience okay? i will give some uh, uh, rudimentary examples okay? so this is uh, uh, this is ganesh chaturthi vinayak chaturthi days it's just over so for uh, for vinayak chaturthi your mother gives uh, one laddu you take it you feel very happy so you take laddu effect is the cause is uh, laddu effect is your happiness you feel uh, fulfilled you take two laddus yes i am quite happy three laddus as yes, some what okay still i am happy Four ladoos, you don't feel that happy. Five ladoos, it's not that happy. So the relationship between the input, the ladoo, the output, your happiness, at some stage it's linear. As uh, it changes, you it becomes non-linear. For example, you travel in a car, you drive the car, you go at thirty thirty kilometers, you want to increase forty. Look, uh, particular to 40 kilometers. You press the accelerator. 
50 kilometers, yes, you press. 60, you press a little more. 60, 70, 80. Then you press even a slight uh, additional pressure, you go to 90, 100. So earlier, 30 to 40, you press a, 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 in a particular way, you, the speed increases. But as you press more and more, and you reach uh, a certain speed, then after that, when you press even a slightest uh, change in the in the input, makes an enormous change. So at 140, even even a very slight touch, you get to 150, and you will lose balance and so on. So initially, it's a linear relationship, but as you increase the speed, then the the relationship becomes non-linear. Okay, so that is the relation between linearity and non-linearity. Similarly, if you have a load, so which a bar, which is held at one end, then at the other end, you, you suspend weight. Initially, you add a weight, more and more weight, that is bending. That is proportional to the weight that you add, that is the bending. But at some point, as you add more and more weight, it breaks, the bar, the, the linearity breaks. So, in that case, you have non-linearity. So, the cause or the input versus output, if it is a one-to-one -one correspondence, you have linearity. When it is not one-to-one -one correspondence, you have non-linearity. So, when we are talking about the linear and non-linear forces, so yeah. we can uh, relate it kind of, can we relate it kind of like, constant force and variable forces uh, like the forces changing with time is kind of non-linear forces because uh, as much as I have understood about the non-linear dynamics is the dynamics of our own world. So in, in, in world, like uh, when we solve a problem in physics uh, at our level, so we just have uh, we just neglect the air friction and other things and all. But in non-linear dynamics, we are just considering all of them uh, for solving the problems. Like, is that li is it like that, or uh, I'm getting it something wrong? Yeah. So I said the force depends. The force is related to the state variables, which means the position, position vector, and the velocity vector. Yes, sir. Velocity uh, means uh, the rate of change of position. The position you also call a displacement. You think of a pendulum. In we start uh, in our school days, uh, eighth standard, ninth standard, we do pendulum experiment. So what do you do? You suspend a pendulum from a pivot okay, of a particular length. So you pull the pendulum apart slightly, and then allow it to oscillate. So what is the force that is acting on the system? So the force is the displacement. The force is directly proportional to the displacement, how much you displace this force. So if here it's directly proportional to the displacement, F is directly proportional to the displacement. Whereas if you think of a planet moving around the sun, so what is the kind of force this planet, I mean, you have a planet moving in the solar system. The sun is situated in, at one of the foci of the orbit in which the planet moves. It's an elliptical orbit. So the force between the planet, the sun and the planet. So what is the force? Why do planets move around the sun in an elliptical orbit? Because gravitation. of gravitation. gravitation. So what is the nature of the gravitational force? It is the inverse fire type. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it's, an, it's a not a linear force. It's a non-linear force. Yes. So typically, the planetary motion corresponds to a non-linear force. But the pendulum, the ordinary, what we call a simple harmonic oscillator, corresponds to a, or a linear harmonic oscillator. It corresponds to a linear force. So that's a linear dynamical system, the ordinary pendulum. Where is the planet moving around the sun in elliptical orbit? That corresponds to a nonlinear force. 
So, sir, as you have introduced the chaotic nonlinear dynamics, so I would like to ask here a question. Like, you have done an extensive research on this topic of chaos. So, what actually chaos is, and what is uh, solitons, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right? So, is that chaos is similar like what we uh, have the meaning in English like? um complete mess and uh, chaos is something like like not that good thing so is it like that in the uh, mathematics and physics or is it something different what exactly chaos is yeah i think uh, you have uh, you have uh, more or less uh, zero down zero down to the uh, the expected meaning uh, that Chaos is something related to complexity. So you say that, uh, for example, in a particular uh, meeting, as a, as people have behaved in a very chaotic way. The situation in the country is quite chaotic, unpredictable. Okay. Predictability is not there. Okay. So that is related to something related to chaotic behavior. I ask. But then something orderly, something regular. So that is perhaps related to what we call as coherent behavior, orderly behavior. So this notion of solitude is related to such that kind of orderly behavior, coherent behavior. So the study of Nonlinear dynamical systems, depending on the nature of nonlinearity, it's very difficult even now to identify which system will exhibit uh, regular behavior, which system will exhibit chaotic behavior. So, what this chaotic behavior essentially means, even small changes, because all these systems, starting from the Big Bang, so there was something to start with. So that something to start with we call as the initial state. Okay. Initial state to start with. Okay. So every physical phenomena you measure, you formulate in terms of differential equations and solve corresponding to the initial value problem. So given the initial state, which you can measure, you can observe, and the system follows, depending on the force, this mathematical equation. So subject to that initial condition, how the system evolves into future uh, time. So initial value problem. Now, when you say the system behaves periodically, for example, so you measure the initial state, position and velocity and so on. To be within certain accuracy, even if there is a small inaccuracy, as this time evolves, the outcome after a large time may not be quite different from the one you expected. But in the case of nonlinear system exhibiting chaotic behavior, even extremely small change in the initial condition will lead to a state to an entirely completely different situation, different state after a long time. So even very small change in, in, change in the initial state can lead to very large changes in the final state. So this is what the famous French mathematic, mathematical physicist Henry Poincaré during the beginning of 19th century said in his studies on the so-called three-body problem, planetary motion, sun, planet, uh, say, Earth moving around the sun, you yes, know, sir. it's moving in an elliptical orbit, yes, periodically. Sir. Then he asked, uh, he asked the question, now the solar system in which it's not only the Earth is moving, there are other seven planets apart from this uh, from the earth now you consider 
in this, uh, uh, I mean, when you say Kepler's law, Kepler's law of planetary motion says that every planet moves around the sun in elliptical orbit. Elliptical orbit. Equal areas are spread out in equal time, and uh, the uh, third law, Kepler's law, and so on. Now you can did did use these three laws in a rigorous way by considering the mo motion of a planet, say like here, around the sun under gravitational force, inverse by type force, by solving the Newton's equation of motion mathematically, you can get these three laws. Kepler, Jonas Kepler, he obtained from observations, from data at that particular time that was available in Germany and Europe. So collecting this data, analyzing this data, he came to these three laws. He came to the conclusion that planetary motion is like this and so on. But now Henry Poincar was also interested not only in the motion of yeah, one planet around the sun. Consider the simultaneous motion of another planet. So actually, you have the sun and all the eight planets moving around the sun. So in the Newton's equation of motion, the sun and the earth, for example, one planet, if you consider that motion, you can solve that. But if you include the effect of another planet, even as a small correction to the motion of the earth, for example. So that problem, he pointed out, it cannot be solved. It's a nonlinear. The, the original problem itself is, uh, is nonlinear. The earth, the sun and the earth uh, motion, uh, the, the combined uh, motion. But if you incorporate the motion of additional planet, then that problem you try to analyze. And then he came to the conclusion that this problem cannot be solved. And he said, in the course of this analysis, small changes in the initial condition, initial state, can lead to enormous change in the final state. Small change in the initial state can lead to enormous change in the final state. As a consequence, small errors get multiplied, magnified enormously. Prediction becomes impossible in this kind of dynamical systems. So even now, the three-body problem cannot be solved. So consider four-body problem, eight-body problem, or nine-body problem. It becomes extremely complicated. In 1960s, at MIT in the United States, the atmospheric physicist, Edward Lawrence, he tried to understand the atmospheric weather. It's an extremely complicated problem. You have to solve what is known as a complicated system of nonlinear partial differential equations, Navier-Stokes equation. But he reduced this complexity to a system of three coupled linear ordinary differential equations, but nonlinear. In the course of this analysis, he again came across this kind of complexity. Small change in the changes in the initial condition during computer experiments led to very large changes in the final calculation. He, to, in order to explain the complexity of the problem, a butterfly fluttering its wings somewhere in the Amazon, in the Amazon forest, which is in South America, South American continent. A butterfly fluttering its wings. Consider the situation in which butterfly has not fluttered its wings in this Amazon forest. And because of this, you consider the evolution of the weather and consider the weather in the state of Texas. Texas in, is in North America. So the weather would have developed in a particular way. Then to dramatize how small changes can affect, he said, a butterfly fluttering its wings somewhere in the Amazon can lead to a tornado-like situation in the state of Texas in a few days' time. Had the butterfly not fluttered its wings, the 
weather would have developed in a nice way, in a smooth way. But because the butterfly fluttered, it means an extremely small change in the weather condition had happened in one part. But that small change has led to a change, a dramatic change in the weather, leading to a cyclone-like situation in the state of Texas, very far away, in a few days' time. Small changes can lead to very large changes. This is what Tayas means. Complexity means. So, even though we are considering deterministic systems based on Newtonian dynamics, okay, based on Newton's laws and so on, small changes in the initial condition is leading to very large changes in the final state. So, prediction becomes impossible. That's why prediction of weather over longer period becomes impossible even now. Even with supercomputers, prediction of weather becomes extremely complicated. And this is what complexity is concerned with when you consider nonlinear dynamical systems. Certain nonlinear dynamical systems under appropriate circumstances can lead to very complex behavior. Even I talked about harmonic oscillator with damping with external forcing, to which you add a small amount of nonlinearity. It's called a duffing oscillator. And that oscillator under appropriate circumstances shows extreme complexity and sensitivity to initial conditions, namely chaotic behavior. So this extreme sensitivity to initial conditions essentially leads to the notion of chaos. Intrinsic randomness. So you said chaos means whether it's complex behavior, complex behavior. Yes, this kind of complexity that even though it's a regular, it's a smooth system, it's a well defined system, mathematically it's a well defined form. Because it's a non linear system, In linear systems you can show this kind of complexity will never arise because linear superposition principle is valid there. But in a nonlinear system, not every nonlinear system will show such complexity. I said the planetary motion, the sun and a planet like Earth, you consider that problem, you can get solution which is very well ordered. You can get Kepler's laws, which which describes periodic motion of planets around the sun in elliptical orbits and so on. But that didn't show sensitive depend dependence on initial conditions. But when you consider slightly more general problem, include the motion of a second planet, then if you consider that particular dynamical system, which is a nonlinear dynamical system, it will show sensitive dependence on initial conditions. This problem of Lorentz, considering the atmospheric weather, in the form of very reduced equations, bare minimum, the so-called Lorentz equations, showed sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And similarly, the Duffing oscillator I mentioned, just a simple pendulum with additional nonlinear force can lead to dramatic difference in its dynamics showing sensitive dependence and initial condition. And this is what essentially chaos means. Now we have very large number of dynamical systems exhibiting this chaos. So how this chaos sits in? As you change system parameters from outside, what we call as control parameters. So as a function of this control parameter, how the system dynamics changes from periodic motions to chaotic motions. We call, we talk about bifurcations from one type of behavior to another type of behavior through periodic motions. We talk about period doubling bifurcations, ultimately leading to complexity chaotic motions okay, in finite range of control parameter range and so on. So the study of even a pendulum with an additional nonlinear force becomes extremely complicated. With all those sophisticated computational power, 
it becomes very very complicated there is no exact analytic method mathematical method to solve the simplest of these differential equations corresponding to just a harmonic oscillator perturbed by a non linear force and then additional external periodic force and so on so a duffing oscillator so even at that fundamental level our capability to solve this equation exactly analytically fails so you require computational power computational help to solve these equations but the study of through computational numerical methods can never be complete because if you can analytically solve it you can describe its behavior for all kinds of situations but if you want to solve it numerically you have to fix certain parameters in the problem you have to fix initial conditions and so on and so forth so there is always a limitation of your knowledge even with all the sophisticated computational problem so even now i will say even that simple problem is not completely solved you can get surprises at every stage so this is what making the study of nonlinear dynamics extremely fascinating and interesting so where does this non linear dynamics and chaos theory apply on the real life does it apply on the real life or uh, we are just uh, applying it on the systems like quantum systems and uh, those things are uh, like the science things uh, or is it has some application in the real life like like the real uh, issues it is uh, like is there something like connected to the common people which we which can be explained to them like this non linear dynamics is solving their problem also like we know that there, there is something like the, every scientific things solves the problems in one way or the other to solve the problem of the people but does it have any direct connection to the people yeah pretty problem i mentioned is that directly related to the problems we encounter in common life yes sir i talked about the simplest problem i talked about the motion of a pendulum oscillation of a pendulum an oscillator so this oscillation you say in the in the classroom when you carry out this pendulum experiment so what do you do you measure the period of oscillation capital t equal to 1 over 2 pi square root of l by g which you verify by changing the length so this is true as long as when you pull the pendulum apart for short short amplitudes okay so whether you pull it apart for 4 cm away or 5 cm away or 6 cm away and then you carry out the uh, oscillations and then you find the period it will remain the same but if you pull it apart over a larger distance in which case you have to incorporate the non linearity to the problem non linear force will naturally come into the picture then you will find the consequence of non linearity changes in the behavior so even in a pendulum the behavior changes so if you want to study the, the if you want to have a complete understanding of pendulum for all kinds of uh, initial stage uh, initial position etc then you have to incorporate the non linear i talked about weather weather yes. is an extremely complex uh, complicated system and even at its barest minimum level lorentz equation that shows complexity so the full dynamics when you want to understand the weather dynamics solving navier stokes equation is an extremely complicated non linear partial differential equation so if you want to understand the dynamics of weather exactly you have to understand the underlying non linear dynamics as well so you cannot solve this problem mathematically exactly so you go to the computer you try to understand but that study when you want to predict the weather for tomorrow after one week after two weeks yes now with sophisticated uh, developments in computation you can predict over short times 
what chaos tells you is long time prediction is impossible so if you want to predict the weather up to one year or two years or one month and also depending on where you live whether you are near equatorial uh, equator or away from the equator so it depends on because uh, the weather is so complex depending on that you can uh, your predictions can become odd so that's why uh, the predictions by meteorologists is always uh, is not always uh, uh, you find to be true so one day they say it will rain it may not rain uh, actually when you, the next day so there is a lot of uh, difficulties but most in every area of uh, science you want to understand the working of our brain for example so it's not only physical system that i have in mind our brain as you know consists of billions of basic entities called neurons and each neuron consists of three basic entities the central soma out of which three like dendrites emerge whose function is to collect information from other neurons and then a tube like a cable like structure emerges from one uh, neuron and it gets synapse synapse with other neurons branched off it gets connected to other neurons so through this cable like situation just like an electrical cable so where you find the ions get transported and they they uh, diffuse across the membranes of the axon so very fine change that takes place where you can make use of all the basic laws of electrodynamics and write down the appropriate equation for the evolution of information information propagation from one neuron to another neuron in the form of a system of six coupled nonlinear partial differential equation which is called hodgkin huxley equation which were derived deduced by two physiologists physiologists medical doctors in uh, early 1960s in united kingdom now the, if you saw that equation that tells you how information propagates from one neuron to another neuron and the basic neuron each neuron itself is described by an appropriate oscillator neuronal oscillator so just like harmonic oscillator you have an uh, duffin van der poel oscillators you have uh, underlying uh, dynamical equations for each of these neurons there are different kinds of uh, oscillator equations van der poel van der poel equations and other kinds of equations uh, oscillator equations or hodgkin huxley equations so if you want to study even the dynamics underlying a single neuron you have a non highly complicated non linear dynamical uh, system underlying system and the brain consists of billions of such basic neurons so you have to consider the collective dynamics of this large number of neurons coupled in a very complicated way complexity comes into picture the study of such complex dynamical system individual system itself is non linear dynamical system and the collective dynamical motion of this complicated system uh, gives you an understanding of how the brain works similarly every part of our human being or any <coughs> uh, living systems not only its non non living systems in any made matter but any made matter its dynamics itself is basically described by this kind of non linear dynamical system social behavior economics for example share markets variations as a function of time black scholes equations it's a again a complicated system of non linear partial differential equations by solving that you may be able to make predictions of share market how it will, it, uh, it will change uh, next uh, next month next year and so on Uh, like that uh, for example covid now we are uh, in this uh, complex uh, situation of covid 19 so people try to make predictions 
modeling diseases prediction of covid so we have we, uh, in our group itself we have given a model so several people given have given mathematical model dynamical models non linear dynamical equations so based on the information input that is available now we make try to make predictions of the number of possible people who will get infected or who will get uh, uh, cured and so on so forth. so so even in these problems you have uh, non linear dynamical equations okay. now when you go to fundamental level at atomic uh, subatomic etc so in addition to newtonian uh, formulation you have to also incorporate what is known as quantum principles heisenberg uncertainty relation into uh, incorporate into the newtonian uh, equations of nature so in addition to newtonian uh, equations you have to also incorporate these heisenberg uncertainty principles so you talk about quantum nonlinear dynamical systems quantum chaos and so on and so forth so the study of any of the problems that you think about which is of common interest uh, which is of interest to common man is essentially formulated in terms of appropriate nonlinear dynamical systems the evolution of the universe itself in which you are living all but einstein had formulated in the form of general relativity so the existence of mass a star a solar i mean uh, planets galaxies so all these things they also affect the space time curvature of the space time so albert einstein had given this connection between mass and space time in the form of einstein's field equations it is a system of pen coupled non linear partial highly non linear partial differential equations when you solve these equations we encounter you come across black holes the existence of quasars or uh, uh, gravitational waves so all kinds of universe uh, phenomena that occurs in the universe uh, comes out so you can try to make prediction about future behavior of the universe itself and so on so forth so everything that is concerned with human life is essentially uh, is of interest for people studying non linear dynamics thank you sir so i think we have uh, understood all the things and uh, we now understand about the chaos we are now understand about the non linear dynamics and the application of that in our lives so let's just uh, move to the next part of the interview if you have seen this part and you have come uh, you have seen it till here so from here we are moving towards the next part i have a collection of questions for the sir uh, uh sir so i will be asking that in the next part and uh, those who are not related to the science those questions are not related to uh, like the research part but those questions are about the sir himself and his experience his views so if you want to know about the views of dr lakshmanan then you can have uh, you can watch the next part so let's just start with the question sir uh first question i would like to ask like have uh, as you have done uh, like there are no interviews of yours on internet and uh, there is not not much information about you. i think this is is this your first interview sir like recording interview uh probably a couple of weeks ago in connection with a recent award some people from hindu some students came they interviewed and so on but i don't know whether they have they have released it and so on because when i was yes when i was searching about you there was uh, there were three uh, like uh, three lecture series but 
I didn't found any of the interview. So no. many people wants to know about your like uh, your personal life and how you became a scientist. So first, my first question is uh, like according to Wikipedia, you have set up a non-linear dynamics department. Like uh, let me just uh, explain uh, to the audience that. center of new uh, non linear dynamics you have set up that and uh, you became the head first head of uh, the department and there you just taught all the students the non non linear dynamics so how was the experience of setting up a department in a university because uh, there are ample of like uh, restrictions and all that we face and there are many things uh, many may, uh, many do's and don'ts that, that we hear uh, but while setting up a department so how was your experience setting up a new department in a university maybe university was uh, helpful or, or maybe some people had some problems so what was the story of uh, setting up that department yeah. yeah that's a very interesting question uh See, actually, I worked in a state university. Yes, sir. Uh, I came to this place, uh, Tiruchirappalli. Uh, place where Raman was born. In 1978. Yeah, the uh, Raman was born in uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, in Tiruvani uh, Kovil uh, in Tiruchirappalli. Yes. Have you seen his house? Okay. Uh, now this uh, his house uh, is uh, is is not uh, is not maintained. Okay. Somebody has taken over uh, something like that. So there there is a big story behind that. So let me not go into that. Uh, so I came to this place, Switzerland, in 1978. Yes, sir. from Germany. uh from germany halland from europe directly so i was uh, doing post doctoral research in europe and uh, i was offered a reader position which, which is equivalent to an associate professor position directly by the university of madras at that time there were only i think two universities in the state of tamil nadu or two or three universities so it's the university of madras having a lot of lots of affiliated colleges all around and uh, madurai kamraj university so this trichirappalli uh, is uh, is the area of uh, university of madras and they had uh, they had uh, uh, organized a, an autonomous post graduate center at trichirappalli Actually, one at Coimbatore, one at Tiruchirappalli. So, I was offered this position of uh, reader at Autonomous Center, uh, uh, University of Madras, uh, Tiruchirappalli. So, I came with high hopes. But then, uh, when I uh, came to the university campus or the Autonomous PG Center campus, I saw it's only a couple of buildings. Uh, nothing more than that so i was initially i was a bit disappointed but then i had a, a, a set of colleagues uh, in uh, there were very few departments in this uh, trichy campus trichirappalli trichy it's also called shaka and trichy uh, there were uh, four or five departments and uh, the head of the department of physics professor p k punswami was extremely helpful to me he gave me a lot of freedom to pursue my research so i slowly uh, expanded my area of activity in this uh, campus and uh, uh, i i formed a, a group of young people around me to carry out uh, further research but by 1982 it was uh, mg uh, mr mg ramachandran stein uh, he was the chief minister so he announced uh, a new university 
centered at Trichinopoly, Bharat Jasmine University, and uh, uh, he gave a large uh, uh, land, uh, almost 1,000 acres at a different place. It took one year, one year or so to move uh, to this new campus and new uh, buildings, etc. have been built. And we had a nice Department of Physics building and so on. But uh, by 1989, uh, I mean, I had uh, worked uh, in different areas of nonlinear dynamics, and uh, I was awarded uh, the SS Bhatnagar Prize in Physical Sciences for 1989, but announced in 1991. In those days, there were delays due to various reasons. So I received the award in 1991 when uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar was the Prime Minister. He was a Prime Minister for a short period. So he personally gave away the awards immediately and so on. Well, that award, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, support came in. And one day, my immediately after that award was announced, my vice chancellor uh, of Bharat Dasan University called me to his chambers and he congratulated me. Uh, earlier, also, he had a function, he organized a felicitation function, but he told me that. I do not know much about uh, what you are actually doing, but I would like to do something for you. So can you give me a list of what you what you really want? I said, yes, sir, I will, uh, I will give you what I require. And then I, I went away, but I didn't take it very seriously because I, I was not sure how serious he is. But then a couple of days afterwards, he, he called me. I told you to give me uh, I mean, you were requirements, but I didn't receive anything from you. So then I, 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 uh, it was clear that that he really wants to do something for me. So I immediately sat over and wrote that, okay, physics department is fine, but uh, it will be better if I have a separate center uh, for nonlinear dynamics where I can have my own programs. But I didn't want to go away from uh, physics department. So I, I do want to have my my association with physics department. So I wrote that I would like to have a center for nonlinear dynamics within the school of our department of physics and with such and such requirements and so on. But in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, he, he took up this to this matter to uh, the syndicate of the university and it was approved and uh, I had the center for uh, nonlinear dynamics. But by the time I had been, uh, I mean, I had uh, support coming from National Board for Higher Mathematics, uh, Department of Science and Technology, and uh, CSIR, and so on. But then I was also uh, a member in various capacities in, at DST, in various committees, and so on. And so, forth. so, and uh, during this period, I had also had been in touch with many of the people working in nonlinear dynamics, uh, not only in this country, but all around the world. So I had visited many of these people in different countries, and they had in turn visited uh, uh, my university and the Center for Nonlinear Dynamics. We had many, many meetings uh, uh, during these periods. And so uh, my group has also. Uh, developed um, and the number of people, young people who pursued their research have also increased uh, quite a bit. And uh, so this interaction had uh, helped me quite a bit to develop the Center for uh, Nonlinear Dynamics quite a bit. And in due course, I also became the head of the physics department. Simultaneously, I was the head of the Center for Nonlinear Dynamics as well as uh, uh, department of physics and so on. So over the years, um, we had uh, some very good vice chancellors who helped me quite a bit. And there were uh, periods where we had difficulties and so on. But still overall, I had a lot of support from my university and in particular from various uh, uh, scientific agencies like uh, in principle, uh, Principally, the Department of Science and Technology, and then uh, National Board for Higher Mathematics, and CSIR, and so on and so forth. And then I started 
serving in, uh, in these agencies in various capacities as chairman of several uh, several uh, scientific uh, committees, uh, fund giving committees. So earlier I was uh, receiving funds through these committees, etc. Then I became member then, and then chairman of many of these committees in each of these organizations and so on. So it had been a very good experience over the years. So all these scientific agencies have uh, supported uh, my research uh, quite a bit at uh, different stages. So, so that has helped me and it also allowed me to invite uh, many people, not only from inside the country, but outside the country also, to host them for uh, shorter or longer periods so that uh, we could collaborate in many of these uh, problems I wanted to investigate. So that has been a very good experience. So to, to conclude then, uh, my experience as a researcher, I come from a very remote part in Pine Metal District, from a small hamlet. So I had uh, uh, until uh, until sixth standard, which was called I think in this day sixth form or whatever it is. Uh, so I had only I had no schooling because there were no schools nearby. So I had only private teacher. Uh, so uh, I, I won't say I had completed five years of formal training. So this teacher, uh, uh, so we used to write uh, in sand. Uh, under uh, tamarind tree and so on. But it was a very good life okay, in those days. But uh, then I moved to uh, a school in a nearby village about five kilometers away. And we used to walk every day to that school and so on. So all my high school studies was in a government board, uh, government board school, uh, high school. So uh, until I completed my equivalent plus two. So uh, at that time, then I went to college. So, so I come from uh, such a remote uh, place. And then I moved to college uh, from uh, those days, pre university at Madurai and then BSc at uh, college for uh, MGM college for For my master's course, I, I carried out, I studied at Madras Christian College. But when I, I was doing my master's course, there were only two colleges in Chennai which were offering MSc physics. One was Presidency College and the other was uh, Madras Christian College. And the nice thing was that uh, every week uh, and one day, we used to have combined class, inter-college get class, given by a professor from University of Madras. So this was uh, during my intercollegiate class, these lectures were given by Professor P.M. Matthews on quantum mechanics, who later became my supervisor, PhD supervisor. So I had got contact with this uh, uh, University of Madras uh, faculty because from college, the university faculty is considered to be, to be at a superior level. So you get hardly get opportunities to interact with them. But this intercollege class was a nice experience. So I had the opportunity to interact with Professor Matthews, who then later on took me as a PhD student in theoretical physics, where I did my PhD in theoretical physics at the Department of Theoretical Physics University of Madras. Okay. So I come from such a background. And then after my a PhD, I went abroad to Germany, Holland, etc. How Germany happened, sir? Yeah, so uh, in those days, uh, people after a PhD used to go for postdoctoral research in the United States uh, or occasionally to Europe and so on. But that was a time, first crisis. Uh, 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 fuel crisis, I think uh, oil crisis. So opportunities in uh, United States become very few, particularly for theoretical physics and so on. 
so i started uh, looking for possibilities in uh, europe also and in europe particularly in germany there is a foundation called alexander von humboldt foundation so that offers postdoctoral fellowships for scientists from all over the world so they call for applications and then select based on merit every year uh, once or twice i think this organization does uh, give fellowship even now it's a huge organization so i made application uh, to this uh, world foundation and i got uh, selected and i went to do my postdoctoral research at uh, university of tubingen where the very old university where johannes kepler originally lived and studied it was a very nice experience and then i also moved to work at uh, university in uh, eindhoven university of technology in poland and uh, by that time i got uh, the uh, invitation uh, and was selected as a reader at the postgraduate center of university of madras so i had to wind up my postdoctoral research after one and a half years uh, so to take up this question so i came from such a situation so even under that uh, circumstance starting from scratch essentially so in those days there were no journals there were no xerox machine it was not internet time okay. communication was extremely difficult but still that we had very nice uh, faculty few faculties but who are all very active very helpful and so on so we had a very nice atmosphere and that helped me and then in due course this uh, nagar fellowship working at a remote place etc gave me a lot of uh, lot of possibilities of interacting with other scientists in this country as well as outside the country so it uh, helped me to develop the center for nonlinear dynamics nonlinear dynamics group as well as the department of physics and so on now paradas uh, university is, is a very developed university and so we have a lot of uh, facilities here and so on then uh, even after my retirement uh, so many of these agencies are supporting my continued research so i think uh, many of the academies in which i am fellow they have supported me from time to time uh, <clears throat> baba atomic research the department of atomic energy has supported me for 5 years as raja ramon fellow and the academies have supported me as uh, as uh, uh, <clears throat> as their scientists uh, at different points of time and for the past 5 years uh, and department of science and technology have provided me it's ramanna fellowship uh, for several years and then uh, they they have been offering me uh, the distinguished fellowship said uh, <clears throat> science and engineering research board of department of science and technology has offered me a distinguished fellowship uh, which i have been using for the past 4 years and now they have selected me as a national science uh, uh, for a national science chair which i will be taking up from uh, october 1st and that will be very handy for me both for uh, my own personal uh, count and also for research support i will have uh, substantial support so these agencies have been very kind enough uh, for me to support my research all along okay, apart from my university so i would say that i had uh, even coming from a very remote part of the country a remote village i have been i have been able to pursue my own uh, goals uh, own uh, scientific goals uh, research goals in a purposeful way there were some impediments from time to time but i think uh, i could overcome all those uh, things with the support of 
the various I mean, my colleagues and the scientific uh, uh, society in this country to a large extent. And I had also received support from all around uh, the world, uh, my colleagues from all around the world in different capacities. So it has been a very nice experience for me personally to pursue this uh, research career. Just on uh, August 15th, uh, the the government of Tamil Nadu had awarded me uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam uh, Award. Yes, percentage. I was reading about that uh, on a news On the Independence Day. So that, I mean, has been a, you know, all the other awards, etc. perhaps it did not excite uh, the people in my village are in my in my I mean relatives and so on, but this particular award, which was given on Independence Day, which was telecast uh, in uh, many channels, was uh, seen by all the people in my village, and uh, my, <coughs> my relatives etc. So that had really given them. Um, a great joy. So, so I have I received uh, congratulatory messages from all of them, from my village, from my relatives, and so on. You are getting a bit emotional about uh, the journey, and it was a beautiful journey, sir. And uh, as many of the people, your uh, state and uh, the academies are helping you in uh, pursuing your research. That's the beauty of science. That's the beauty of uh, our country. That's what we are known for. And you know, that's what we do because that's what we are about. Like that. That's why, that's why we are here. And uh, hopefully you have, these people have given you this much and you have given the country back all the things and you are training all the students of your students and making them preparing them for future and uh, preparing them to create the future to uh, uphold the country's future so that's a very great thing so yeah, I, I should also say for example the department of science and technology that's a very nice program it's called inspire Particularly, I mean, they had different categories, particularly for school students, uh, uh, for 11, 11 standard students. Okay? They have these five day inspired science camps, which is being held from all over the country in different parts, of the country, different colleges. So, so we invite uh, scientists from, uh, from different areas and uh, give lectures. And that's an extremely important, interesting, uh, interesting contribution by the Department of Science and Technology. And uh, wherever I go in those lectures, I try to point out that uh, during the 15th century, actually, this was uh, this I came to know from a book I. I, I came across uh, in one of the libraries in the city of Seattle, Seattle in the USA. It's by Alex uh, von Tunzelman, uh, the, uh, the Fall of an Empire, uh, or something like that, the history of an empire, secret history of an empire, or something like that, which is available all over the world. So the first, uh, the first uh, uh, introductory part starts with there were two nations in 1500. There were two nations, one of which was extremely prosperous, extremely uh, cosmopolitan and so on, sports. Uh, the other uh, gives an, uh, uh, explains this nation in such great uh, terms. And there was a second nation, which was uh, uh, Poverty ridden. Uh, I mean, he uses uh, st with stinking masses and so on and so forth. And you'll be surprised to know the first nation was India. 
the second one was England. Yes. Can you imagine? It was year 1577. So this country was at its zenith. Scientifically, economically, everything. But 18, 1877, exactly 300 years afterwards, the Queen Elizabeth, the Empress of England, crowned herself as the Empress of India through her uh, son. She didn't come, she sent her son to the Darbar of Delhi. So in 300 years, a change had taken place. How? Why? Because England had gone through scientific revolution, consequently industrial revolution. And they conquered this massive country, a small country had conquered this massive country. So the basis of which is science. So this is what I tell the students. Okay. So science can make enormous contribution to the development of countries, to the development of history, changing history. So we should work with that. And how you use the scientific knowledge plays an important role. How people are using that knowledge. Like some is some are enhancing the lives of people and some are building weapons from that knowledge. So that's just two different cases of using science. Yeah. yeah. So it depends on how you use uh, uh, of course even even those is 1500, uh, 1800 uh, I would say because uh, England was so poor so medieval it was ridden with uh, religious feudalism, religious conflicts, and so on and so forth. But yet, as science evolved, thermodynamics, the science of heat, because in Europe it was extremely cold, living itself is extremely hot. So to overcome this, you have to understand heat. So they understood heat, the dynamics of heat, thermodynamics. Heat engine was invented, steam engine was invented, transport became possible. When this was fitted into ships, they could make long travels over the seas. And when these ships were fitted with, uh, with guns, gunpowder was invented, guns were fitted, they could travel several thousand uh, kilometers. Come, few people to come and conquer this big country. So sometimes these weapons are also helping countries to subjugate other countries. So that is the way civilization has been developing. So it all depends on how you utilize your knowledge to the development of your country. But as far as this country, there are many problems. But they can be, all of them can be overcome by appropriate application of science through the concerned people. There is a quote by Sir C. V. Raman. I, maybe I misquote him, but uh, he said that my life is an utter failure. I want, like I bring the Nobel Prize home and I wanted science to flourish in India and uh, to develop the country with the science. But all we have today is the followers of West, like not the real science, but just the following of West in our country. So that's why he was like, he wasn't that happy with his Nobel Prize. Like he wanted to do the research, but so what do you think, sir? Uh, uh, when now, I, if we are talking about this, so let me ask you a question. So 
in our course books in every course book of uh, india like science books and the history books and uh, uh, the story books we are missing out one thing like whatever the india has done in the science that's missing out in that part so we are not teaching any of the research of uh, uh, like sir c v raman's research or uh, sir meghnath saha's research or any of their research like uh, if we are if we talk about uh, there was a very fundamental work by uh, sir j c bose on uh, the when he invented the crystograph and even uh, the wireless telegraphy so we are not teaching our children about the about what has happened in india and we have the proofs that this thing has happened in india i am i'm not going about i'm not going to talk about the aryabhatta era where, where we don't have that much of uh, proofs to just uh, say, uh, make a statement but we have proofs about these people and we are not teaching our uh, our students about their research and their knowledge and uh, especially there is no story of them uh, at present we, we are lacking uh, in uh, we are lacking a lot in telling their stories so uh, what are your thoughts about uh, this thing like don't uh, aren't we just teaching our children the research of our indian scientists also along with what uh, they are studying in uh, their classes yeah it depends it depends on the place and uh, uh, and the nature of uh, institutions etc but by and large um, i would say that uh, we do teach uh, the uh, the science that has been explored by different people in this country for example we do study uh, the contributions of ramanujan raman etc at least in this part of the country and uh, i think uh, uh, bose uh, uh, jagdish chandra bose or uh, um, satyan bose so uh, all these aspects are uh, taught to some extent uh, and perhaps in bengal these are taught more uh, i mean there why just uh, in back some back. regions of the country why not the why not it is standardized to every region so that uh, yeah. people should people might yeah, get an idea yeah it's being done but uh, but uh, uh, to to appreciate these aspects one uh, one requires a certain basic uh, basic uh, uh knowledge of uh, of uh, science i think so and it's also uh, left to the educators to bring in the stories of uh, these various giants of the past who have uh, who have contributed from this country uh it should be done and it can be done very easily okay but i would say that um, not only uh, stories of uh, scientists uh, from this country but also from other country yes. are also not uh, taught uh, that much so maybe uh, these aspects should be taught to students along with that of politicians so so that uh, young people will get to know Uh, about the contributions of these various people that will motivate them uh, as they grow yes so that's the reason and i think that's where this um, uh, inspire camps etc are very helpful so some of the speakers do emphasize on the contributions of indian science uh, masters of the past how under difficult circumstances they have uh, 
contributor to different areas of science and technology. Uh, so I think, uh, I do hope that in future that uh, we will have uh, better information that is being passed on to young people. So there are many, many other scientists. There are also uh, contributions uh, that uh, have not been made uh, so, so familiar to young people. For example, uh, the Kerala School of Mathematicians over centuries, I learned that Newton's laws were perhaps realized by these people even before Newton. Uh, and calculus, perhaps in certain form, was also perhaps developed by them. But that has not penetrated into larger section of the society. So that was very unfortunate, unlike the West, because that was the start of scientific and industrial revolution. So many, many people have taken up what Newton had done or other uh, scientists have done at that point of time. But here, it was the beginning of dark ages. So from uh, 15, for example, from 1500 onwards and so on. So not many academic uh, activities uh, have, uh, have uh, progressed during this period. So only, uh, starting from 1900s and so on, and after independence, uh, all these things have uh, become more common, and people are getting, uh, are coming to know about these uh, details. For example, you asked about Raman's house. So we, uh, at some point of time, uh, the academies tried to acquire that house and so on, but. Somehow it did not click and so on. So like that, uh, to get to know the significance of uh, this kind of uh, matters also becomes important. I think okay. in future, people will come to know about that and they will make enough efforts. I would be interested in talking about someone from the Kerala School of Mathematics. That I can get some uh, something out from there, and I can get you for my audience so that they can know yeah, about. I, yeah, I think you can get hold of some uh, some scientists uh, who are worked on these aspects. Yes. I have I have a dream to just uh, went down to all the. Uh, like hidden gems of the country, like all the hidden scientific gems of the country and just document them and in a video or some, some documents so that uh, I can show this to my, to the country. So what this uh, country was gifted with and what we have done in past and what we are actually doing now, because there are so, uh, the science communication, like the work that we that the scientists do in the labs, uh, doesn't get that much of uh, attention of the people because that's hard to understand, uh, like what exactly the scientists are doing because that's purely the science, and uh, you need a lot of knowledge to went through what the scientists are doing. But don't you think we need people who can? Uh, just explain what scientists are doing to the no, uh, to the common people, to the layman in their language. So, uh, don't. Uh, what are your views on the science communication? Yeah, uh, science communication is uh, quite important and quite relevant. But the point is, um, active scientists. Uh, uh, most of the active scientists uh, who are seriously engaged in scientific research and so on may not have that much uh, inclination or, or uh, ability to explain their knowledge 
at a common man's level, common man's language. It's extremely difficult, for example, to explain some of my own words uh, in terms of uh, language that is, uh, that is understandable by ordinary people. So I talk about, uh, when I talk about soliton or a magnetic system or an uh, optical soliton, etc. It's extremely hard to explain what that uh, particular thing is. When it becomes so, basic science essentially becomes engineering and technological tools. Basic science gets modified or it's, it's utilized in engineering and technological aspects. So when it comes to a technological aspect, when I talk about nonlinear optics, so it's very, very basic because I have to talk about Maxwell's equations, nonlinear Maxwell's equations, and from which, out of which, how uh, optical solitons comes about and so on and so forth. But when I talk about laser, or about, uh, the various aspects of laser, uh, how laser, affects uh, common life and so on, where it's applicable. That becomes easily understandable for a common person. But to explain the underlying physics behind these, uh, et cetera, it becomes rather hard. So that is where scientific com communicators can play a crucial role of extracting uh, the, the contributions of the basic science in a language that is decipherable by common people. So, so some scientists may have that ability, but in general, it's very hard uh, uh, for uh, a serious scientist to come to that level to explain the, some of the complicated stuff uh, they're trying to do. That's where the it is not. It is not that they don't want to do that, but probably they don't have the time and the inclination to do that. Okay. So I think uh, science communicators uh, can uh, help in disappearing or uh, uh, propagating. Uh, a gap can be filled by the science communicators. So oh, sure. they can get the information out from the scientists and they can deliver it to the common people. Yeah, sure. See. Sure, that will be very helpful. Yeah. There, is, uh, there are some areas, application-oriented areas, where uh, we may be able to explain, uh, uh, explain uh, their, uh, their contributions in more more simpler terms. Okay, so it also depends on the field in which they work. But as far as basic science is concerned, it requires some skill to, uh, I mean, different kind of skill to explain uh, the, the various uh, uh, contributions they are making. So, uh, sir, uh, let me just move to the next question that is about the lockdown. So from last two years, all of us are in a state where uh, there is an uncertainty in, uh, in our lives that like, uh, once uh, like, do we have to stay at our homes or just uh, we can go to our offices and the laboratories for doing the research and our work. So, in that era, the computer systems have become a lot popular. I'm not saying that uh, computer systems were unpopular before that, but uh, the technological aspects, like we, did, uh, we didn't had any laboratory where we can do the experiments. So uh, the virtual labs and virtual data that was available uh, on the internet and uh, some other places, so that has become very popular and computation has become very popular in the last two years. And a lot of people are uh, emphasis, uh, like uh, emphasizing on the computer systems and uh, the computation part. So 
we can we have some uh, applications which can uh, uh, which can take the input uh, input and can give out the outputs of some experiments like we have the virtual labs uh, as i uh, as i uh, told you earlier so these are helping out people in the lockdown but in long term there are uh, like uh, there isn't uh, like people would uh, when they are in the uh, physical lab so uh, wouldn't they get confused with the circuits and all because they are the uh, in the virtual lab there are no circuits and they, you are just given an input and you are getting an output so don't you think that in long term these virtual labs can play with the brain of a person and then uh, can reduce the creativity and curiosity of knowing more yeah of course the virtual labs the kind of uh, kind of facilities we are using during this lockdown period they are only stop gap arrangements we do not have anything else we do not we cannot go to our uh, laboratories even for a theoretical scientist i mean sitting at you are uh, sitting at my home doing my own work all the day my mind uh, completely stops uh, working i have to go out i have to discuss personally with my colleagues with my students with my scholars uh, and so on i have to write it on boards they have to write it on the board so i have to observe them and what is happening i have to discuss with them of course this uh, online uh, discussion etc helps to some extent but that is only because nothing else is available at least we try to do and my colleagues working in uh, experimental physics experimental biology etc they are suffering very much experimental chemistry etc when they are unable to go to the lab I mean, uh, some of the biologists, people, etc., they are uh, dealing with living things. So when the labs are closed, they lost all their uh, samples, etc., etc. So it's a great loss. But then we cannot avoid that. We have to live with the times. So there is some help through the computers as a means of communications, or a lot of data available which you can make use of. We, uh, in some of your computational aspects and so on. So when there nothing is available, we try to make use of it. So that's all. We have to come to. We have to go to our uh, laboratory. We have to do our standard work and so on. We have to resume that. But probably such things have happened in the past. So you think of uh, World War, World War Two, for example. for almost 4 years i think scientists uh, uh, in europe and in, in the united states etc and japan etc i think they have, they have completely stopped their work they could not uh, carry out any of their work and so on but after that after the war was over when things were uh, uh, things uh, got resumed they got into full uh, speed and uh, probably they have uh, they have uh, uh, compensated uh, the loss uh, of years uh, to some extent and so on so i do hope that uh, the present in the present situation also hopefully in the next few months etc when we overcome uh, this um, uh, pandemic completely i do hope that uh, all of us can work uh, even more at an even more uh, even better rate than we used to do earlier i'm sure many of the people will try to compensate for the loss of time uh, that each one of us uh, have basically uh, uh, lost during the past few years so nothing can replace the real lab and the real institution and so on uh, but at present we have to live with 
whatever that is available sir a lot of people are uh, from the science background like uh, the engineers the phd students and other people from the science background are heading towards the uh, commercial courses like mba mca so these things are going on in our country and people are diverging their fields so don't you think that we need to increase the opportunities in science so that people can get uh, more opportunities and can uh, indulge in science and can do research or real inventions in uh, for the country yeah this uh, this is a very, very difficult question uh jobs if you think from the point of view of jobs it always uh, it is driven by market i would say at some sometimes scientists do get reasonably good offers jobs opportunities etc but the, there are times which are decided by external uh, factors and uh, circumstances and so on so people have to wait for suitable jobs particularly people uh, doing science i think this is also true for in any other subject whether it arts or in engineering etc so it changes from time to time in engineering for example at some point of time uh, civil engineers or mechanical engineers were all in high demand so on or electrical engineers and so on there were uh, changing times and then uh, more opportunities uh, are coming for computer scientists and then information scientists and so on so depending on uh, other developments uh, so, on. so like that science also uh uh that may support may come from the from the government point of view from the government uh, sector or from private sector and so on but then i think as far as science is concerned there is one section of scientists who want to always concentrate on scientific research whatever be the situation whatever be the opportunities that are available elsewhere so they will try to stick to to scientific research uh, as far as possible and for that set of scientists i think there are always opportunities as i try to explain in my own case uh, coming from a very remote part of the country uh, etc still i could uh, i could wade through the complex uh, uh, complex uh, situations and so on and i could keep my research work going on uh and uh, at different stages and continue even after formal retirement uh, almost 15 years i am continuing and i can continue for many more years like the kind of questions i have been offered and so on so forth so for people who are really motivated who want to pursue uh, scientific research i think there will be opportunities available but not everybody can hope for that so particularly i see for young post doctoral uh, the young people who have completed their phd at this stage in my own group or in in physics as a whole or in science as a whole there are many people who are uh, trying to find uh, some t- even temporary post doctoral positions uh, at uh, at different institutions and so on uh, so they are facing difficulties uh, in the but the country is also offering are trying to find uh, such postdoctoral positions at different levels through different agencies for example the ugc the university grants commission offers the dr ds kotari fellowship postdoctoral fellowships uh said the science and engineering research board of department of technology so they offer national postdoctoral fellowships and csar offers research associate positions and similar dae offers uh, positions etc so you can search for them you can uh, uh, you can look for them and you can 
uh, you can get these fellowships. And uh, you should also search for, it's not only in this country. I mean, once you complete your PhD, the world is wide. Every country, every developed, advanced country, uh, countries which are developing, not only in the West, uh, in Europe, uh, United States, but also Japan, Taiwan, China, uh, Korea, not uh, South Korea, uh, and uh, countries like that. They also offer lots of uh, postdoctoral positions, and some of them may even get absorbed in permanent positions and so on. So opportunities are available uh, at, uh, uh, at, uh, at different places. People nowadays even go to uh, Russia or South Africa and so on and so forth, and, uh, and in the Middle East, uh, Arab countries, the universities are uh, offering uh, very good uh, positions and uh, fellowships, etc. So you have to search for them. But ultimately, most of the people would like to have a base in this country, in their own country. So here also, opportunities are coming in. And there is a great responsibility uh, on the society, the governments. It's not only the central government, but also the state governments. They, they have to play crucial roles. The academies uh, also playing uh, an important role in helping uh, many of these uh, people. Uh, so all of them and the uh, private uh, industries, etc. They have to also offer. Uh, I mean, it takes. It doesn't take enormous amount of uh, amount of uh, financial support to help young people, say, at the at the PhD level, post PhD level, etc. Uh, it is possible uh, by different. Uh, uh, different uh, sectors of the society uh, in this country to support uh, young people to a large extent. And as you know that there are now a very large number of uh, private colleges, arts and science, engineering colleges and other colleges, private universities, etc. have come up and they offer positions. But uh, you know that in many of the places, uh, uh, it may not be uh, sufficiently supporting. So there should be some way of, uh, some way of uh, taking care of all the requirements of the young people in these private uh, institutions. So some institutions are extremely good in all aspects, uh, providing scientific uh, atmosphere, financial, uh, financial uh, adequate financial support and so on and so forth. But there are many institutions where uh, much more effort is needed. So if all these agencies uh, come in an appropriate way, I think young people can always be supported uh, and their dreams can be, can be really fulfilled. So there are opportunities and they have to be made use of uh, in an appropriate way. So, uh, thank you very much, sir, for joining with us. Uh, one last thing I would uh, request you to, that uh, uh, just one advice that you would like to give for a young mind so that they can uh, follow that advice for the future and then uh, can do well in their life. Yeah, I think... Uh... From my own uh, personal experience, uh, from the background with uh, which I come, I think it is a single minded devotion for the aim, a purpose which you want to forge ahead. So, the single minded concentration, devotion will definitely help you to overcome whatever the odds you will face in your life and you will become successful. 
I think that's what the message I would like to leave for the young people. So you will always succeed in your life. All my best wishes. Thank you very much, sir, for sparing time for us and for our, uh, for answering our questions and for giving us that much of uh, knowledge. And hopefully, many of you have got an idea about what non-linear dynamics is and the things that sir have taught, uh, sir have told us about his personal life and how his journey, how he became a scientist and how he is uh, and where he is now is the roots that he had in the past. So we will request sir that uh, uh, he will join us again and uh, will answer our questions again and uh, uh, will talk about his collaborations with other scientists like uh, uh, he has collaborated with other scientists and has done a enormous work uh, in the field of nonlinear dynamics which we haven't covered yet but we will be covering next time so just with that request i sign off here and thank you very much, sir, for uh, joining with us and giving your precious time to us. Thank you, sir. Namaste. Thank you very much, Prof, for your uh, patience. And uh, I do hope that I have uh, tried to convey at least uh, some basic uh, ideas behind uh, this uh, subject of nonlinear dynamics and the ways. Uh, to pursue scientific research uh, and so on, which uh, young uh, people like you may find uh, useful in your further career. Mm -hmm.